you've probably noticed that the areas you travel through can be very different in quite a short distance. For example, in North America, going from northern Montana to southern Utah, you have some stunning plains, these rolling mountainous forests, bleak desert, and finally these bright orange canyon lands. This always had me wondering, in such a short time, how could there be so much change? And this leads to how the natural world is organized and where, geographically, this happens. Welcome to Eco Atlas. My name is Aiden, and I've recently rediscovered a passion of mine that I want to start exploring in videos and learning more about. That interest is being ecoregions. What are ecoregions exactly? Well, that's what I'm going to be diving into in future videos on this channel. But this video is going to be focused on some of the background context, such as what are the biomes of the world and what are the differences between the biogeographical realms. Once we have that down, I'm going to start making future videos really exploring this concept and the differences between the ecoregions of the world. The most common way to separate the natural world is through its biomes. Biomes being distinct geographical regions with specific climate, vegetation, and animal life. They're most commonly differentiated from each other by temperature and precipitation, creating different environments based off of these factors. There have been many ways to define biomes through the years, but the most common, and the one that I'll be using for my videos, will be Olson and Dinerstein's model, or the WWF model created in 1998, which separates the world into 14 distinct biomes. Starting with the tropics, which, being close to the equator, do not have much seasonal variation with temperature, are quite warm year-round, and have very consistent sunlight. The tropical moist broadleaf forests are very large rainforests. They occur in the Amazon in South America, the Congo of Africa, and the rainforests of Southeast Asia. Year round, they're very stable with consistent heat and precipitation, often receiving more than 10 inches a month every single month. They're very diverse and often the most biodiverse of the biomes. In contrast, the tropical dry broadleaf forests are not quite as stable. They have consistent heat, but the precipitation varies a lot, having a monsoon type climate. They will receive four months of heavy rain, six to 12 inches a month, followed by up to eight months of drought. They occur in Eastern South America, the Western coast of Madagascar, and are very common in India. These forests are not as widespread as the Amazon-like tropical broadleaf. Similarly, the tropical and subtropical coniferous forests, largest in Mexico and Guatemala, but also in Southern Asia, follow very similar monsoon-type climates. But the cooler temperatures and higher elevations favor conifers instead of broadleaf forests. They are a very unique but not widespread biome. Then we have the tropical grasslands, savannas, and shrublands. These are largest in South America, the African savanna, which is just an iconic landscape, and Northern Australia. They receive enough rain to support grasslands, but not enough to support the tree cover needed for forests. They have very warm, stable temperatures as well, and monsoon climates. But when it rains, it doesn't pour nearly as much as the dry broadleaf forests. The flooded grasslands are truly a very unique biome such as the Everglades, which are grasslands that are often flooded year-round, the Pantanal in South America, Africa's large deltas, and finally the Amur wetlands. There are very large complexes of grassland-wetland mixtures creating unique areas, and they can fluctuate seasonally, but are always large wetlands during the wet season. The mangroves of Central and South America, Western Africa, and Southeast Asia are forests that grow in sheltered salt waters along the coast in soft muddy soils. They're used to both salt water and fresh water. They have different types of trees that are adapted to both water types and long root systems that help support them in these fluctuating soil conditions. Moving away from the equator, we'll start to see a larger variety in temperature differences between seasons, giving us the temperate zone. The temperate broadleaf forests stretch across eastern North America, Chile, much of Europe, China, Japan, eastern Australia, and New Zealand. These forests tend to have moderate but consistent rainfall, roughly 2 inches a month all year, with 10 to 20 degrees of seasonality between the cold winters 
and moderate summers. They're dominated by broadleaf trees, which often lose their leaves in the fall. The temperate coniferous forests dominate Western North America, with scattered areas in Europe and large areas in Eastern Asia. They often have wet, moderately warm summers, but cooler and drier winters where the conifer needles help them thrive. There are always exceptions to this rule, however, such as the moisture-laden forests of Vancouver Island in Canada. Temperate grasslands, such as the Great Plains of North America, the Patagonian Steppe of South America, the Steppe of Eurasia, and the grasslands of Australia. These habitats can vary immensely, but they always have less moisture than forests, drier cold winters, and mild to warm summers. Their summers receive moderate rainfall, two to three inches a month, but winters are often dry and cold. The Mediterranean forests and shrublands occur in California, Chile, obviously the Mediterranean, southwestern Australia, and southern Africa. They're very common on western-facing lands where the summers are long, warm, and dry, with the winters being wet and mild. Even closer to the poles, we enter the subarctic and arctic regions where the summers are very short with long cold winters, most of the precipitation falling in the form of snow. The boreal forests or taiga, massive forests dominated by evergreens such as the boreal forests of Canada and Russia, there are huge seasonal temperature swings of up to 30 degrees celsius between the freezing winters and mild summers which receive very little precipitation, two to three inches a month for the summer and less than an inch a month for the winters. Finally, to the extremes of the north and south, we'll reach the tundra of northern Canada, Greenland, and Russia. With the vegetation dominated by lichens and grasses, winters are long and freezing, summers are short and mild. Finally, there are two biomes not determined by temperature and location to the equator, but instead determined by precipitation when incredibly low can't sustain year round plant life, creating the deserts such as the Mojave in North America, the Atacama Desert, the Sahara, the Gobi, and the Great Victoria Desert. The days are hot, the nights are cold, and often rain is blocked by either mountains being too far inland, high pressure, or being coastal, where all precipitation comes in the form of dew and fog. The final biome we're going over is determined by elevation, when very high creates the montane grasslands and shrublands of the Andes, the Tibetan Plateau, and the New Zealand Alps. These occur above the tree line, creating a world of shrubs, rocks, and mosses. By looking at the world and its biomes, this explains why regions of the world feel so different. However, this can lead us to ask a new question. If the biome is the exact same, why do two different places with the same biome feel so different, such as the grasslands of North America versus South America? They have similar biomes and similar ecosystems, but a huge difference in their species, which leads us into the biogeographic realms. These are large areas of Earth's surface where organisms have evolved in relative isolation over long periods of time and are separated by geographic features, such as deserts, oceans, or mountains. The Americas are split into two separate realms with the Nearctic consisting of North America and the Neotropical of South America, which was isolated for over 50 million years. Where these two realms split is not super clearly defined, but commonly as the rainforest of Mexico to the south along the coast as the neotropical region and the mountains and deserts of Mexico as the Nearctic. These two land masses are now connected but have quite different species due to the continents coming into contact as recently as three million years ago. Europe, Northern Asia, and North Africa make up the Palearctic realm separated from the Afrotropical realm of Africa by the hard to cross Sahara Desert the Pale Arctic is also separated from the Indo-Malayan realm of Southern Asia by the Himalayan mountains. The Australian realm is made up of Australia and the surrounding regions, which have been isolated for over 70 million years, and these are separated from the Indo-Malayan realm by the Wallace Line, 
The Antarctic has its own realm in the far south. The final realm is the Oceanian realm, consisting of the isolated islands of the world, which are incredibly unique because of their isolation and make up the smallest region of the world. So we've talked about biomes, all 14 different biomes that can span across different continents. And we've talked about the biogeographical realms, which are mostly separated by the continents. So what ecoregions are is essentially dialing in the microscope a little bit, zooming in. Each biome has a multitude of smaller ecoregions. The difference between the type of grasslands in the foothills versus the actual open prairies is an example of two distinct ecoregions. They're both part of the temperate plains, but they're quite different. Why is it important to break the world up into these ecoregions? Well, firstly, it's conservation. If we can better understand what differentiates ecosystems, we can better understand how to protect them, what species live there, and how to really understand it and enjoy nature. For me, simply seeing how diverse the natural world is by exploring these lesser known areas and learning about new species and landscapes is why I'm so interested. There are many ways to break out these areas, but for these videos, I'll be basing it off of One Earth's framework. And there's the 14 biomes and eight biogeographical realms, which we talked about, and they break it into smaller chunks called bioregions. And there's 185 terrestrial ones. And then we'll even further down, there is the 844 terrestrial ecoregions. If we go to the example from the start of the video, traveling from Great Falls, Montana to Cedar City in Utah. That'll have us passing through the Northern Shortgrass Prairie, the Montana Valley and Foothills Grassland, the Snake Columbia Shrub Steppe, the Great Basin Shrub Steppe, and then the Montane Forest, and then the Columbian Plateau. You're just skirting around near the end. So these are all part of three separate biomes, but we have seven unique ecoregions here. And on this channel, we will be learning about regions such as the Madagascar spiny thickets, the Crimean submediterranean forests, and the montane savannas of South America, to name a few. Thank you for joining, and please like and subscribe if you want to see more related content in the future. Cheers.